Hi, I'm Adam in Wales and this is my board gaming vlog and today I've been relegated from my games room by the noise of drilling outside uh, and so I'm going to sit here and I'm going to tell you about 10 games that I think you might not have heard of. Now admittedly, if you're German, you may well have heard of some of these games but for everybody else, hopefully some of them will be new to them. So number 10 on the list is the game Cube. Cube is a dice game by Tom Lehman. Now, Tom Lehman made the game um, To Court the King, which later became Favour of the Pharaoh, and uh, he also made Roll for the Galaxy. In fact, he's most well known for that game and the card game Race for the Galaxy. So Cube, it's surprising that no one really seems to know about it. Now, this is lighter than something like Roll for the Galaxy. It's uh, essentially a family-style game, but it has those same sort of... Um, uh, well, fancy dice basically. Dice with all different sides, custom sides, dice with different abilities and purchasing different dice with different abilities to do different things in a similar way to something like Roll for the Galaxy, although this is much, much lighter. In Cube, players are attempting to gather ingredients for magical spells, but in reality this is an abstract game. On your turn, you may allocate a token to reserve a spell card as your own. You then roll all of your dice. The dice may offer special powers, allowing you to re-roll dice or swap dice with alternate coloured dice from the supply. You must now set aside at least one of your dice into your dice tray. You can then roll the other dice again. Once all of your dice have been placed into your tray, you can see if you've matched the dice results needed to complete a spell card. These may require exact numbers, or exceeding a total score, or rolling a set of matching dice. Different coloured dice have different markings on them, so getting the most useful dice effects is a useful strategy. After a set number of turns, the game ends, and the player with the most valuable spell cards wins. Uh, it's a slightly dubious rule book, uh, not the clearest thing in the world, um, but it's not a complicated rule set, so you can pretty well work out how to play it. It's got some weaknesses in the components, you know, paper boards and uh, things like that, but the dice themselves are lovely, and that's what this game is all about. The second game on my list is the game Emerald by Rudiger Dorn. Now, this game I never would have looked at. Firstly, it's got this odd, thin box, it's got this uh, not particularly enticing artwork and a pretty dull name. Um, but I was given this game for free by my local game store, uh, Rules of Play in Cardiff. In a, uh, basically in a raffle, a Christmas raffle. So, I mean, I was delighted to get a free game, took it away, played it, and it was really, really good. It's a really good gateway game. Set collection, simple rules, but interesting rules, particularly the movement rules are interesting. Rudiger Dorn is known for using interesting movement mechanisms, and this game is a good example. This game now dates back 40 years at this point so it's a pretty old one but it's it's actually very attractive when it's all laid out the game is short uh, it's, it's it's easy to pick up it's a great gateway game in emerald players are knights attempting to steal gold and gems from a dragon's cave on a player's turn they move one or two knights of their own color they can move exactly as many spaces as there are knights in the starting space when a knight lands on a cave space, they can take a gold or a gem card from the space. Players are attempting to hold the majority in each of the four gem colours, and each gold is worth its face value. If a knight reaches the treasure chamber, they receive a treasure card, which is worth many points, and that knight is then out of the game. If a knight ends its move next to the dragon, then the dragon moves one to three spaces determined by a die roll. If it catches a knight, the player must decide to bribe the dragon, losing a gold card, or let the knight be eaten and removed from the game. The game ends when the last treasure card is taken, or if any one player has only one knight left, then the highest score wins. I came across Bangkok Klongs when I was uh, basically on a bit of a Clemens Franz fix, looking at all the games by uh, illustrated by Clemens Franz on the back of loving uh, Agricola and Le Havre and... Um, you know, those sort of games. So I picked up quite a few. Mines of Zavendor, Gnomes of Zavendor, Port Royal, 
One of the ones that have stuck around in my collection though, one of the best, is Bangkok Klongs and yet nobody really seems to know about it. This is a game by DLP which is the same company that made Orleans recently and it's a game by Martin Schlegel who's a very good uh, game designer that you may not have heard of. This is a tile laying game, it's not always the most intuitive game in the world but it's very intelligent and lots of strategy and um, beautiful, beautiful pieces. It looks great Definitely a hidden gem. In Bangkok Klongs, players attempt to place tiles into scoring positions and gather sets of fruit from the board. On a player's turn, they place one tile onto the water and draw a new one from the deck. If an umbrella is showing, the counter moves up the track. Eventually, this marker will indicate that it's a market day and scoring will happen. Boat tiles must be placed adjacent to other boats. If the boat has no merchant in it, then the player can place one of their own merchants onto the tile. When a market day occurs, each player can score boats once or twice each. To score, they choose one area where there are four boats around a landing point. They add the number of baskets on the boat together and multiply it by the number of their own merchants in the area. This is their score. Each other player in the area scores two. After scoring, one tile is removed by the active player and placed into their stock. At game end, the fruit from the board will be used to form sets. Once the umbrella reaches the end of the track, the game ends and final scoring occurs. Several boats in the game have special features allowing players to steal boats from the board, to protect boats or to double their scoring opportunities. Hamster Barker or Hamster Cheeks. This is a, really a placeholder for all manner of different Amigo small box card games like the game uh, 23 or um, Schrauber Locker. Um, or, you know, th there's loads of them. Um, and Hamster Backer is a really good example. In Hamster Backer, players try to collect hamster cards which will constitute points at game end. On a player's turn, they take two actions. They may take all the cards from one pile on the circular selection of piles of cards on the table, and then they reallocate cards around the circle. Place sets of cards from their hand into a so-called blocking pile, this prevents other players from playing sets matching the top card of their pile. Or finally, they may score the cards in the blocking pile, adding them to a separate scoring pile. Scoring these cards also allows the player to steal cards from the player with the most cards in their hand, taking a number of cards equal to the top number on the stack and adding these to their scoring pile. When there are only three piles remaining in the circle, the game ends. Players count the number of cards in their scoring piles and subtract the number of cards in their hand. This is their final score. The player with most points wins. Simple, set collection, uh, quick playtime, beautiful um, artwork, a nice neat little package. Uh, you can find the English rules online, look at Board Game Geek and you'll find them. Um, the game itself has no German in it. So if you can get hold of a copy of this, this is a really good filler or a great game to play with families. Now we're on to some really amusing ones. Leglos, or Leglos, or I don't know how to pronounce it, Legless is a, essentially, it's very similar to something like code names. Essentially we have a grid and one player is trying to point all the other players to one particular card on that grid, in this case an image. But the way that they do it is hilarious and they, they're gradually running out of options as they try and point you to more and more pictures. It helps that the pictures themselves are really nicely drawn in that cartoony way. In Leglos, a central grid of 16 images is placed onto the table and on a player's turn they secretly draw a tile which indicates one of the images. They then attempt to construct an abstract representation of this image using only wooden sticks and discs. The other players guess which image is being drawn but they're only allowed one guess each. When the correct image is guessed the artist moves on to a new image and the process repeats but they may never reuse sticks or discs so this pool of resources reduces with each subsequent image. After two minutes, their turn is over and players score points for their correct guesses and the artist scores points for the number of images they manage to have guessed by the other players. The game ends when everyone has been the artist once and the most points wins. It's just so weird and Zoc Verlag is one of my favourite publishers because they produce such weird games and this is not the only game of theirs that you're going to see on the list. Um, as a party game that you can play in 20-30 minutes and have a real good laugh, this is this is ideal. It's not as thinky as, as code names. It's um, 
Uh, I shouldn't keep comparing it to that because they're very different beasts. But it's that fact that you're pointing towards a grid and you're trying to direct people towards one particular card. Um, hilarious game. Can't believe I've never heard anyone talk about it. I'm so glad that I found this game. I've noticed recently on the Board Game Geek website that Sheep and Thief is up for a, a, a release by Pegasus Spiel, and that is wonderful. I do wonder what they're going to do with it. Um, this is a card game from Japan Brand, uh, and it's, it's essentially got drafting, like Seven Wonders style drafting, but also tile laying, like something like Carcassonne. It's simple, it's attractive, it just works so well, um, and, and, and it's, it's loads of fun. The components in this version Again, like I said with Cube, we've got paper boards here, which is a shame, but we've got these little cotton wool sheep. It's weird, <laughs> but, you know, it's a nice little package. It's a really, really good game. And I wonder what Pegasus Spear will do. I wonder if they'll replace the cards with tiles. That might mean that the boards can be smaller, so everyone can have their own individual board, and it might actually be made of something other than paper. But this is guesswork. We'll have to see. I'm just glad it's going to get a wider release, because this is a game that I think loads of people should be playing. In Sheep and Thief, players attempt to gather sheep and connect roads and rivers in order to score points. The first phase is simultaneous as players draft their cards, taking one from their hand and passing the others around the table. In the second phase, players take it in turns to add one of their selected cards onto their own map. Some cards have sheep on them, some have sheep dogs which move the sheep, some have thieves which steal sheep from opponents, and some have cottages which protect sheep. When four cards have been played by each player, the round ends and new cards are dealt for another draft. So this process continues until three rounds are complete. Players score points for their sheep, for connecting roads to the town spaces on their maps, and for connected river cards. The most points wins. Now I said Sheep and Thief was a game that loads of people should be playing. I can't really say the same for Serrano because this is a game really for a few people. It's a real niche here. We're talking about a game about writing poetry, a party game about writing poetry. What that means is this is a party game where everybody sits silently for, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, writing poems and then reads them out to each other and we all laugh at what we've done. Now, to a lot of people, that's going to sound really dull, but I love it. I love sitting and writing. I love hearing the other people's poems. It's got mechanisms in there that mean your poems are going to be funny, whether you like it or not. In Serrano, players write poems and score points for using obscure rhymes and writing the most pleasing verse. Each round, a card is revealed dictating the theme of the next poem. Additionally, two word ending cards are revealed, which must form the rhymes in a four line poem. Two of the lines must end with one of the rhymes chosen, and the other two must end with the other rhyme. And when poems are complete, players take turns to recite their poems. Players then score points for using words at the end of each line that were not used by any other player. After all players have scored for originality, they then vote on which poem they like the best. They score points if this vote tallies with the votes of other players. When the game ends after several rounds, the player with the most points wins. Now I've played this, games, it, this game in a sort of, uh, not really a party atmosphere, but in the gaming atmosphere where everyone you know, tries to do things fairly quickly. I've also played it where we've spread it out over essentially an afternoon and you just take your time to write your poems. It might take you half an hour, it might take you an hour, but then we're gonna come back to them. Meantime, we're doing other things. We're making cups of tea, we're pottering around the house. So it's an extended sort of, uh, game that we keep sort of coming back to as people finish off their poems. Um, it's really funny. I don't know how easy it is to get hold of now. It's by Repos, um, which is quite a big sort of publisher, um, but I suspect it won't have sold particularly well. <laughs> but if you can get hold of a copy, if you like writing, creative writing, if you like writing poetry or funny little rhymes, then this is a great game for that. It's also got one of the worst board game components I've ever seen, which is this cardboard standy thing that you slot cards into. Doesn't really work, totally unnecessary, doesn't spoil the game by any means, but, uh, but it's a funny package all round. I feel bad showing you this really, because I'm not sure how easy anyone is going to find it to get this game. I suspect it was a very small print run a few years ago. I got it for free at the Essen Fair when I bought another game. I bought a, 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 a game that I've long since forgotten and long since left my collection. But this one was given to me for free when I bought it. And this game has stayed in my collection. And in fact, it's one of my favourites, certainly one of my favourite fillers. This is an abstract game. It's a, quite a thinky sort of chess-like game. but. 
but really clever and, and plays in a short time frame and lots of variant rules you can add in there and that sort of thing. It's got this weird gaudy sort of Bomberman artwork that, that, that really, well, it's not attractive, is it? Um, but the game itself is just an excellent design, an excellent abstract strategy game and well worth anyone picking up if you can get hold of a copy or even mocking up a copy if, if, if you know, it, it doesn't take much in terms of components. But Baby Boom is something, the reason I wanted to put it on this list is because I think publishers should be looking at this game. I would love to see it brought back. You know, the, the, the designer, Max Vallenbois, um, and Ludicom was the, was the publisher. Now, I don't know who owns the rights to this, but I would love to see this game reprinted um, and, and maybe in a slightly more lavish production. Excellent game, Baby Boom. In Baby Boom, each player has a number of bombs of their own colour placed on a communal grid. On a player's turn, they move one of their own bombs one space, reducing its value by one. When the countdown reaches zero, the bomb explodes, removing all other bombs from the grid which sit in the same row or column as the exploding bomb. These bombs may belong to the active player or the opponents. The exploded bomb remains on the board and it's worth one point. Players may push other bombs by moving into their space only if their own bomb shows a higher number and both bombs will count down. When only one player remains with unexploded bombs, then the round ends. That player scores points equal to the number showing on each of their bombs. Other players score for their remaining exploded bombs on the board. After three rounds, the highest points wins. Variant rules introduce pits to push bombs into, walls which block explosions, traps which explode, pinball tiles which bombs can bounce off of, and conveyor belts which move the bombs as they step on them. Following Baby Boom, here's another game that should have a reprint, Harbin Goot. Now in 2012, when I went to the Essen Spiel Fair that year, this game was in the bargain bins, 10 euros a pop. And uh, I, I already had a copy, I paid quite a lot because it was already very difficult to get hold of in the UK. Never had a release outside of Germany. Um, the English rules are available online. Brilliant stock market game. Really, really good. I mean, recently we've had the game Stockpile that's come out with big success. This is as good. I think it's better, actually. It's got two fantastic mechanisms in it that just work so well. One is sort of limited information about the market um, in a similar way to the game Between Two Cities. You're working with players either side of you. So it's got that slight, well, not really cooperative, but we're sharing information with players either side of us. And the other thing is about eliminating a player who's not generous um, in a similar way to games like Lords of Zidit, where some players, although they may have done very, very well, there's one category that they haven't done so well in, and as a result, they don't, um, they, they don't qualify for the final scoring. In this game, that works brilliantly. Um, it's, it's short playtime, uh, easy rules, um, you know, easy to explain, easy to pick up, attractive. Uh, I, I like the stocks and shares themes. I know it turns a lot of people off. People find it dry, but I really enjoy that thing where other players are helping me, but they don't know they're doing it. Uh, and I can I kind of leech off their success. It's a really nice mechanism. And I, 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 I like that in a board game. So I would love to see Harbin Good come back by Carlo A. Rossi and Winning Moves. In Harbin Good, players purchase shares and manipulate the market to make profit. In the first phase of the game, players take turns to buy or sell one to three shares, and if they wish, donate one of these shares secretly to charity. In the second phase, each player takes turns to manipulate the value of the shares. They do this by playing two cards, one at full effect and one at half effect. The players are chosen from the racks placed to the left and right of each player. Each of these racks is visible to two players only, so each player has limited and different information about likely future market fluctuations. This sequence repeats four times and then the round ends. Each player reveals the shares they've given to charity and receives money for their charity board. Another full round is played and the game ends. The player with the most money wins, but the player who gave the least to charity is eliminated regardless of their accumulated wealth. Now, I've just realised that Leglos, 
It's by Carlo A. Rossi, who's the same person who made Harden Good. I've never realised that before. I love both these games. Really glad to see that. I don't know who he is, Carlo, e. Rossi. Carlo Rossi. Never really thought about him before. But it's nice that a designer has made my list twice without me even realising it. So uh, well done, Carlo A. Rossi. Um, and I really hope that both your games get wider release at some point. And I'm going to look up after this video what else you've done, because these are both brilliant games. Auf Teufel komm raus, one of my very favourite games, and a game by a mother and daughter design team. Now that's a rarity. Again, it's from Zock Verlag Games, which is one of my favourite publishers. That means it's going to be a bit weird. This is essentially a gambling game where no money changes hands. We're using poker chips, really good, solid poker chips, and we're pushing our luck, trying to take... Um, coal from the devil. Uh, it's it, it's just so much fun. I love the push your luck mechanic. That's the same thing that you see in sort of Ink and Gold or Can't Stop. Th this game is different to those games and it, it, it does it so well with such attractive components. Short playtime, uh, easy rules. Um, I, I, I can't rave about it enough. I'm always up for a game of Auf Teufel komm raus. In Auf Teufel komm raus, players take turns to take coal out of the devil's oven. They place bets on how much coal they can remove without revealing a devil token. High bets bring the greatest rewards, but they can also lead to ruin. The first phase is simultaneous. Players place betting chips into their fist, representing the amount of coal they think will be pulled out of the oven by any single player. The second phase sees players take turns to pull coals out of the oven and reveal the values. Players can stop at any point or they can continue to pull more coal. Revealing a devil ends your turn and makes your coal worthless. After all players have taken a turn, bets are resolved. Successful bets double their stake. The highest successful bet trebles their stake. Unsuccessful bets lose their stake to the bank. Bonuses are awarded to the player who drew the most coal pieces, and the player who drew the highest total value of coal gets a bonus too. The game ends when one player exceeds a value of 1600 in betting chips and then the highest score wins. Now, if you're gonna look for this game again, only a German release, but English rules, no English language needed to play the game. In fact, none of the games that I've mentioned uh, have any problems, you know, they're all language independent, even if you need to look on German Amazon or something like that in order to pick up a copy. So anyway, there's 10 games that I think are good, that I would recommend. Some of them are excellent towards the top half of that list. Um, search them out. If you enjoyed this video, if you found it useful, then please watch some of my other videos on Adam's Board Game Wales, that's my YouTube channel. Please subscribe, or you can follow me on Twitter, at Board Game Wales, and on Board Game Geek, I'm Adam78. Thanks very much for watching, all the best.